It's all yours. Good Good morning. Welcome to One Million Cups. Welcome everyone to One Million Cups. Thanks for being flexible, being up on the bridge. We were displaced in the classroom for today for an all-day event. Um, They pay, we don't, so we got booted. (laughs) Anyway, thanks for being flexible um, in the the, the temporary space here. Uh, Today we have Tim Scales of Civic Rise. Tim just completed what was the Groundwork Labs Accelerator in Durham, American Underground. Many of you may have heard of it. Some of you may be familiar with it. They are now rebranding. They are now um, known as NC Idea Labs. And we will speak a little bit about that program after the presentation. So for now, Tim, it's all yours. We look forward to hearing your story. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to start by asking you all to think of something for me. I'd like you to remember a time when an elected official, someone who supposedly represents you, did something or said something, uh, voted for something that you strongly disagreed with. And you thought to yourself, this makes me mad and I need to do something about this. Or, I might not have to dig too deep for that, but if you do, (laughs) think of a time when, uh, when an elected official did something that you strongly agreed with and you thought, this person needs a pat on the back and I need to let them know how I feel. So you have this moment in your head. Now be honest with yourself, did you actually do anything? Did you take the moment to contact that legislator to make your voice heard, to stand up for that issue? I'm sure this room is above average, but if national odds hold, then one in 100 people actually take action. One in 100 people. This one. And this is a problem for these organizations, issue advocacy nonprofits with a mission to further a political social, or environmental cause. And a crucial piece of their strategy is mobilizing the millions of Americans that care passionately about that cause, but need a little help to take action. But there's a communication breakdown. The tools that they use, email and social media, are increasingly ineffective in mobilizing that audience. Particularly the younger generation, these organizations are seeking a new channel to more effectively recruit, mobilize, and retain millennial supporters. They're looking for civic rights. So what is Civic Rise? Well, Civic Rise can be thought of as the Fitbit of civic engagement. And to help you understand what that means, I'll walk you through our smartphone app that individuals download and use to subscribe to these organizations. They receive calls to action to uh, take action on behalf of that cause. They receive background and context on why this is important and why now. These actions could be to contact a legislator, to register for an event, to post something online, to participate in the legislative process. They are easily able to complete the action through the app. They report back on their success. They track their progress over time, receive incentives for taking action, share this with their social community, and build an online social network of fellow informed and active citizens. So organizations now are able, through email, to mobilize action at a rate of about 1.8%. So 1.8% of the people that receive a message will ultimately take action. Civic Rise, conversely, is mobilizing action at 15%, which is eight times higher than this customer's current best alternative. So Civic Rise is serving a social mission, but we are a for-profit venture. This target market of issue advocacy organizations is a $26 billion industry, and they are nonprofits, yes, but they invest in technology that helps them scale and further their mission. And about 10% of that technology spend is on communications tools, and it's this $90 million market that Civic Rise is seeking to address. And this is the first step, because with a growing user base of engaged and active citizens, we are looking ahead at the 2020 and 2018 elections as key opportunities for further growth, serving customers like political action committees and campaigns. So where are we now? We launched our MVP in May. We're online with 10 beta customers, about 500 users, and we're currently averaging about 7% weekly growth in user base. We're reaching these customers mostly through our direct sales, uh, process at this point. Uh, we are looking primarily at North Carolina, at these statewide nonprofits uh, who I have personal connections with. Our revenue structure is a monthly subscription fee. We are pre revenue. This is the hypothesis that these organizations will pay a monthly subscription for use of the platform, and that subscription will be scaled to their number of subscribers. I'd like to talk about a couple of challenges that we're facing. We have lots of challenges, obviously, but uh, a couple of big questions that we're seeking to answer are. Is this user growth sustainable? Is this 7% sustainable? A lot of the users we're getting now are from our customers. They're recruiting their own supporters to join them on Civic Rise. Uh, We also need to be able to attract people directly as an organization. 
uh, are experimenting with different channels to do so and how to do so efficiently. And can we bring our customer acquisition costs down? So this direct sales channel is a lot of my time, it's a lot of my team's time, and it's expensive. And we need a more efficient way to reach these customers if we're going to reach the scale that makes this a, a profitable venture. My name is Tim Scales. I'm co-founder and CEO, a recent graduate of Duke's MBA program with 10 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, including working with and for these target customers. My co-founder, Tobias McNulty, CTO, is a software development expert and previously co-founded and managed a successful web app development shop here in the Triangle. We founded Civic Rise with the goal of mobilizing one million actions within our first year, and this is a lofty goal, and we've got a lot of work to do to get there. Uh, so we're seeking like-minded individuals who are interested in partnering with us, excuse me, with us to help us scale. We're also seeking introductions to leaders and nonprofits who would potentially use Civic Rise to mobilize their base. And so I'm going to close today with the question that we put to our users every day, and that question is, are you ready to take action? Thank you. Now I'd be happy. I can do a dance. <laughs> dance for a minute. Yeah. Any questions? Yes, sir. That's what we're trying to work out at the moment. So at the moment, all you can do is just track your progress and sort of see how many actions you've taken. Uh, but we're, we're working with uh, behavioral scientists at Duke who are helping us develop a more robust incentive program that is about not just like can you build a streak, but uh, balancing intrinsic internal incentives for just taking action within the app versus external incentives like partnering with businesses to receive discounts if you take a certain number of actions, uh, businesses that support a cause but uh, it doesn't fit within their, their core operations to actually support that cause as a way to incentivize their supporters to take action. So a lot of uh, thinking and work to do there. That's the path we're on. I just want to understand. So is this like if there's a vote coming up? Is this to influence that vote, or is this to kind of make a voice heard after the vote and say, no, we didn't like that? Could be either one. So we are a platform, and our organizational customers are the ones making that call of how to use it. And so for the most part, it is sort of pre-vote or pre-event. They're mobilizing people to contact their legislators. Uh, there is a little bit of post-vote. Uh, let's show our support to this person who did something in support of our cause, or let's tell this legislator uh, we disagree with that vote that they made and we're going to be in touch with them before the next one. Uh, so folks are using it in a variety of ways. Yes? If I had an issue and I wanted to come to you, let's take up an issue like banning or not companies or something silly like that. Um, if I wanted to do that, what, what would the process be? I want to come to you, how much would I pay? What are the steps? Yeah, you as an individual, or are you representing an organization? Um, either. At the moment, so we're limiting it just to uh, established organizations who have either 501c3 or 501c4 status, uh, just to have some curatorial control over what kind of content people are sending. Uh, we're a little nervous about having these individuals sending content through there because everything on the internet evolves into something bad. And so <laughs> how do we stem that in some way? Uh, at the moment, so organizations come to us, they set up a free account, uh, they're able to recruit subscribers to subscribe to them uh, publicly. Once they hit a certain subscriber threshold, then payment will kick in uh, once we are in revenue phase. Uh, we're looking at about 50 to 100 subscribers, they start paying $50, and then it's about 10 cents a subscriber beyond that. Yeah. So I assume this is party agnostic, and you have like competing, uh, you know, uh, initiatives yeah. on the platform at the same time. Right? I think that's when we'll know we're successful, yeah. is when people are advocating in opposite ways yeah. on one platform. That's when we know that we've reached the right market, we've reached our potential. Yep. With your revenue model being monthly with how engagement usually happens within a certain time frame, for example, as you come up, <coughs> low ticket come up for elected officials, whatever that is, is monthly subscription the right model, or is it a repay model of three months, six months, a year, two years, or whatever level they're at? Do you see people turning it off as a monthly subscription, or getting out of it once their event is done? Yeah, our, that's a good question. I think we're still trying to struggle with that question of which is the right uh, model to use. Our hypothesis is if we have a lower monthly rate, well, let me back up. So currently, organizations are using email, they're using social media, and they're occasionally using 
uh, more intensive paid campaigns in the sort of six weeks prior to a key vote or a key event. Uh, we're taking the money that they're spending on that intensive campaign and spreading it out so they can retain users over the long term. And so this is a different value proposition to these organizations, and one which uh, allows them to build a long-term relationship with their supporters as opposed to just wait until something critical is happening, uh, marriage them with, with emails and text messages, and then leave them for a long time. So that's what we're looking at now. You may be absolutely right that there, there is a different model that is more based on uh, time of use or something like that. But it's like buying events. Yeah, buying one month, you have about six weeks of the day for six weeks of the day. Right. Like, can you pay for three months on one of the days that have to take that and then Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, I yeah, think it's on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about partnerships with, because uh, it seems like to me it might be a DJ right now, somebody to champion the platform and uh, maybe on those on those different type of fronts. Have you reached out to contact anybody? Maybe maybe make a video of some sort of someone that can champion that to actually talk about the issue on the platform? No, but I'd love to. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think you're absolutely right, is that we as Civic Rise can champion this, and it's only going to get us so far, but if we get either really prominent organizations or key figures that people respect to talk about how this is something effective, uh, if we get a celebrity endorsement, that kind of thing, uh, that I think is the best way to reach sort of the grassroots supporters. Yeah, give it to me. Well, one of my senators told me he didn't read some of those stuff. How, how is he going to know that? He told straight up, he told us he doesn't read some of this stuff which comes to him. Yeah. Uh, right. So how are you going to make sure he gets the message? Because he told us he does not read. He doesn't listen to everything that he can't read. Well, that is a very frustrating thing to hear from your elected representative that's to begin with, us. for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a big challenge. A lot of the contact that uh, this is getting a little bit uh, into the weeds on it, but uh, the way that you're expected to contact elected representatives now are through these online contact forms. Uh, and they go to an intern, and they go to an 18-year-old uh, college student who sort of files them into buckets, and that's the, as far as they ever go. So part of the goal of Civic Rise is to meet people where they are as potential civic activists. Advocates. Uh, and if uh, all they want to do is do something online, then that's great, but move them up in the level of effectiveness to up to phone calls, up to meeting with their legislator, uh, and use this as an educational platform as well to help people become more effective and more informed. And as a result, make that message get to that elected uh, representative, break through those different barriers that they've set up to sort of silo themselves. Have you seen this platform in Germany where uh, it's algorithm, you know, the, because most of these uh, senators don't read, they use it that, you know, when people start typing up some stuff and advise it to them, like Facebook and other ones, who send a message to you, you need to focus and take a look at it. It's a platform which uh, mm -hmm. uh, the legislature for Germany, where you know, they can tell us fake news, but then put uh, Facebook to, and Google to be reliable. When the senators, most of the senators don't read some of this stuff, but when people start rising that, Checks right to them say, hey, you can focus that. The German, like the German Chancellor who gets that platform. Have yeah. you ever seen that one? Uh, I have not, but it sounds super smart. Yeah, they just yeah. they just uh, implemented about uh, what, two months ago. So, okay. you know, I'll you know, remember the name of it? Do you, do you know, remember the name of it? Uh, I'll look it up, but I'll, I'll tell you. There's a platform. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, they, they just did that, that, that platform. It goes right to the Chancellor and uh, she can tell, hey, I need to focus on this thing. That's great. Office, legislation, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. We've got some. Uh, okay. There was another one here. Yeah. Just from a um, number of subscribers, if you're connecting into a nonprofit that has a, a lot of employees, say a thousand employees, would you consider giving the employee, not charging for the employees to be on the platform as well to help get the word out? I consider that. That's a great idea. Yeah, we are happy. So. Uh, an individual on the platform, user on the platform, generally subscribes to three to five organizations. So they come in with one and then they join others. And that's part of our uh, value prop is that we're helping organizations reach new people that they don't otherwise have. So if uh, a large organization with a thousand employees came on, brought those people, and then they subscribe to other organizations, we're happy to bring them on for free. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if you're looking for the long-term engagement, do you think that political tools are the constituents of some sort can of the platform to reach out to those people who are more interested in specific specific causes. So 
not only could you use it for the nonprofit sector, but you can use it to sell essentially to you know, political figures who are also running as another connection to possibly like the 25 to 40 year old base that is going to be voting in who are strong in those type of grassroots campaigns. Yeah. Because they're going to potentially be your long term um, consumers of information. And I think that you can flow both ways. So not just nonprofit ways, but political ways as well. So you should probably. I think that'd be a, a, another way of thinking about a secondary revolutionary. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think if we reach a certain scale, we're going to be the best source of data on uh, how complex individuals can be in terms of what issues they support. Most organizations just know, like, I know this person and they support me, and they don't know anything else about that person and what else they support. Uh, so all the data coming through Civic Rise could definitely be uh, something of value that we can sell. Okay, just a suggestion is we're having a hard time hearing, and yet you such a lovely soft voice. <laughs> and that's because of the air blowing. Um, let's all help and put the up so that we can all, especially in the back of the room, or maybe those in the front stand up, and, and because we're all, we want to all participate. Um, Bob, I think you were the next. Or, yes, I'll, I'll stand up, but I don't know okay. if it's so. <laughs> so, I'm not even sure I know where to start with this, but um, it seems like your market is too small, and at least the groups that you posted up there, Target audience, at least in signing up for this, are all engaged for the most part of identity politics. And I'd say the reason you have Donald Trump sitting in the White House for a day is because people are sick and tired of identity politics. And there's a lot more individuals out there who would rather understand what candidates actually stand for, who's running the polls, who could potentially become new candidates to start replacing, you know, train the swamp, quite frankly. Out of agree with it or not, on what you and how you go about doing it, there's a swamp. There's a swamp there at the state house, there's a swamp in Washington. You need a new city wise to be. How do you get new people to actually run the office based on issues that matter to individuals and help them get to that level in a grassroots way? To me, that's a much larger market. And, and, and frankly, if you can tell me I can pay $10 a month. To have automatic lobbyists, which is and, and help candidates and talk to candidates that are actually going to make a difference. That would be worth it to me if there's another couple of million people like me out there, which isn't a lot, you know, in that nation of 350 million where we are. Right. To me, that's a, that's a much more scalable and helpful utilization of something that you're trying to build. Helping, helping this organization, that organization get a message out. They already got that. Yeah, I hear you. Um, and I think that you've sort of touched on uh, something that we're that I'm struggling with also. Is are we creating something that? Uh, forgive me if I get a little bit uh, political, but creating something that doubles down on the current way politics operates. And uh, could we be creating something that's more transformational? And I think that the way to get into this is to create this uh, because it works within the current structures that people are working. Um, but this being entirely successful doesn't necessarily have any system systemic impact. Uh, and I think that's what you're talking about, about how do we surface uh, candidates that pay attention to the issues that their constituents support. How do we improve the structure of politics in general? Uh, that's something that I care deeply about as well. Uh, whether or not I can do that with Civic Rise now is a question. Whether or not we can get there with Civic Rise is another question. Uh, and I definitely hear what you're saying. Yeah, thank you. That's it. What prevents you from spreading fake news? So many people say, here's what we like to send up, speaking of the swamp. Um, and they, they come up with a big score or something big about their point or something like that. And it looks like some rise is there to spread the word. Um, do you vet any of the information you're about to spread or do you just take it and take it and love it? We vet the organizations and then trust them at this, at this point. Uh, so the only folks that are sending content through are ones that have a, a tax status and therefore we're assuming a certain level of legitimacy. Uh, if they 
if they don't live up to that trust, then we'll definitely need to look at how we don't participate in this fake news arena. We don't just take a Facebook stance of like, oh, we're a platform, we don't do anything. Uh, and then, oh, actually, we did a bunch of stuff intentionally. What role can fake news have that access? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we're not there at the campaign really committees. Right. Yeah, I think that's a fair criticism. Very true. Yes, sir. What are you doing to have a diverse <coughs> team so that all sides can be represented in your team and make sure there's cohesiveness on the platform? We are, so the question is how are we creating a diverse team of civic guys? And I think our first step is how do we a team how do we get big enough where we can have a team uh, but I hear what you're saying I think the diversity on this team is critical to the success of this that if it's I mean you saw me and Toby we don't look that different uh, so we need to be aware of that and not just uh, uh, in diversity on all levels so gender and ethnic and also political opinion because uh, there's no way we can stand legitimately as a nonpartisan organization if we're all progressive Democrats no one on the right is going to respect this organization as a potential uh, partner in their campaigns. And so we need to understand how to be better at that. I think this question. How are you uh, marketing? Uh, how are we marketing? So at the moment, uh, to organizations, it's mostly just direct contact to our customers. Uh, so we have lists of prospects that we're talking to, and uh, mostly just doing that by phone, which is why uh, the customer acquisition cost is a question. Uh, for the users, we are first providing content to the organizations to send through their channels to reach their current supporters. And we're also marketing through Facebook and Facebook advertising at the moment. Uh, and then constantly experimenting with new ways to find different channels to reach people. Okay. Yeah, we are not, um, but there are some great companies out there that are scraping the legislative websites and putting that in front of our customers. So we are sort of forming partnerships with those organizations because they address two sides of that of that question. Um, but yeah, but that's not something that we are addressing. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have your platform used for local politics just based on no, it can be used for any level. So we go down as far, well, we go from president down to school board. So uh, I think our a key area where we can be particularly useful is on the local level. And a community level group or something who uh, doesn't have access to the tools that the national organizations do to reach their, their local legislators, local representatives. So the organization that subscribes to your service, do you sort of like set up what they do? In other words, like they load up the relevant politicians they just create a profile and they're able so all the the legislative contact information is already in there and they can set it up so that uh, if they're addressing a whole state they can uh, have people contact their specific legislator based on their address or if they're addressing a school board or something they can have that information ready to go as well so it just takes 15 minutes to get started uh, technically and then how to use it effectively is something that we're working with the organizations on how to use this effectively uh, there's one question over here, and then I think maybe there was. Yes, sir. Um, what's your status of intellectual property? Uh, minimal, I would say. There's probably nothing technically here that couldn't be replicated and that we uh, are, have any defense against. I think our defense comes from scale, uh, comes from being the, the platform that enough organizations are using that they want to be, other organizations want to be on that same platform, but that's where the users are. We are. We have gone through no specific legal process at this point. So, as you bring that up, it feels like maybe that's something we should be looking at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe if you get some help. <laughs> yes, um, I see that you guys are looking at the taxes. But how are you limiting access to the country that is coming? So, look at this U.S. politics, German politics, Indian politics, whatever it is. Are 
Yeah, I think my my answer is not particularly strong on this, in that we are at this stage only limiting by the fact that we're limited in size, uh, and we haven't necessarily had to answer that question yet. Uh, so I think that's definitely something we need to think about. And as you were mentioning earlier about uh, how do we be more careful about this content? Uh, as we grow, that's going to become increasingly pressing need, and so it's something we should be addressing now so that we have those structures in place for, for future growth. Can I probably have one final question? Yes, sir. I'm trying to give one away, too. So I was just curious, are you the forerunner in this concept? We, uh, so there's about four now. And we are the forerunner, and three others have come since. Uh, two are based in Silicon Valley, which is an unfair advantage, and one is based in New York. Uh, we, the differentiator here is that we're the only platform that allows you subscribe, to subscribe as a user to multiple organizations. Uh, the other ones are creating sort of white label tools for particular organizations. Uh, and so we're, we feel like we have a scalable platform and they have sort of a service model. And we're, we're exploring that with them. Please, thank you. And thank you all so much for the questions and your time this morning. This has been great. Thank you. As I mentioned before, um, Tim just finished with uh, Groundwork Labs, now NC.